Hello, everyone. This is Lou Zaccarella for The Better Satellite World. Today, we have a special edition of The Better Satellite World for you. This was a conversation that took place as part of the New York Space Business Roundtable on November 17th with, among others, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, SES, and Barclays Capital. It was a discussion as part of our continuous exploration on the topic of ESG. We looked at the S in ESG, the social factors informing the industry, and we looked at, among other things, its impact on finance, industry growth, and potentially the things that it can do to inhibit innovation and all of those things. We thought it was a really lively discussion, quite important for the future of our industry, and we wanted to share it with you here. So we hope you enjoy it, and we hope you will continue to make a better satellite world. You know, it would be challenging to find an industry which touches the aspirations of humanity more than the space and satellite industry. But as it becomes more diverse, like society, and as our culture takes the turn toward what we have been discussing, today we ask if we are doing enough on the social scale to accommodate this vision of a trillion plus commercial business on a single planet, which is aspiring to lead us to other places. Do we need to lead and to be the change we think we want to see? That's one of the questions we'll be asking today. Conversely, we will take a look at current thinking and policies around ESG from four different views. These include a major innovative satellite operator, one brand named financial industry player, and one prominent law firm to see if what they are doing might be a detriment to the future of commercial space. What is the real value of giving so much emphasis to the S of social? Well, we're being provocative here. This is the New York Business Roundtable after all. What will be the impact on the brand and the overall health of companies? Will taking the politically correct S steps increase value for investors? Are social factors universal? Or are they in themselves a new form of control by a very few? Well, we have a fourth person who has been thinking and writing about this in a report that you'll be able to access, who puts this proposition to the test along with his three colleagues, and you'll meet them all soon. So before we pull ourselves up to the round table, SSPI and the New York Space Alliance would like to thank the sponsor of this series, Luxembourg Trade and Investment, located here in New York. Our media sponsor for this series is Space News Magazine, our usual moderator, by the way, Jason Rain Rainbow, is a new father and couldn't join us this month, but he'll be back with us in December, and he uh, sends along his regards. The New York Space Business Roundtable is also supported by World Teleport Association, the Washington Space Business Roundtable, and this month, a new supporter, New Space New York, and we welcome them all. And now I'd like to welcome my colleague in this monthly journey, the founder of the New York Space Alliance, Mr. Joseph Fargnoli, who will introduce our guests and get us going on the questioning. Good afternoon, Joe. Thanks, Lou. Good afternoon. It's good to see everybody today. You know, we're really looking forward to a lively conversation today as we look at the role of S in ESG. We thank you for your willingness to join this conversation as we explore the impact of this topic on the new space community. It's the social aspect of sustainable investing and business management that we want to look at today. And we're going to ask provocative questions like how do new space companies manage their relationships with their workforce, societies in which they operate, and the political environment? So we've got a great uh, set of speakers set up for today. I want to introduce them. I want to start with Ms. Sabrina Alam. Sabrina is currently working at SES, developing, creating, and implementing the environmental, social, and governance strategy. After her bachelor's in theoretical physics, Sabrina decided to step foot into the world of space by doing her master's at the International Space University and graduating with her master's degree. During her time at ISU, she went to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center to work on an astrophysics project and later went to ESA, EAC, to work on a project related to radiation shielding of a moon base using lunar regolith. She has expertise in a range of industries and took on roles within data analytics to program management to the program management of satellites and is involved in designing STEM programs for young people. She is the founder and local group leader for the Luxembourg Women in Aerospace Group and a member of the IAF International Project Program Management Committee. Welcome, Sabrina. 
next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Douglas Jarrell. Doug has an has uh, execution responsibility for the aerospace defense and government services vertical, having joined Barclays in August 2018. Prior to joining Barclays, Doug spent five years in investment banking at Bank of America. Doug has a broad has broad industry transaction experience spanning sell side and buy side M&A, equity capital markets, leveraged finance and investment grade debt capital markets. Prior, prior to investment banking, Doug served in the United States Navy as a nuclear submarine officer stationed aboard the USS Toledo. Thank you for your service, Doug. Doug graduated from the United States Naval Academy with a Bachelor of Science in Systems Engineering in 2007 and received an MBA degree from Duke University's Fuqua School of Business in 2013. Mr. Anthony Nolan is a finance partner in the New York office. Anthony has, has a domestic and international practice that emphasizes lending transactions, fixed income securities, structured finance, structured products, insurance linked securities and derivatives and regulated regulatory issues. He often works at the intersection of finance and investment management, including trading and regulation of swaps and security-based swaps, loan trading, securities lending, and repo, as well as traditional borrowing and leverage transactions. He holds a JD from Columbia Law School and a BA and MA, BA and MA from the University of Oxford. Last, I'd like to introduce Mr. Richard Morrison. Richard is a research fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute where he works on understanding the proper boundary between voluntary and state action and advocating for voluntary economy, property rights, and permissionless innovation. In other words, free market capitalism. He's the former senior editor, program manager, and director of new media, and the director of media relations at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. So as you can see, we've got a great group lined up today for this conversation. To get us rolling, I want to frame a first question. And I think I'm going to direct this starting with Richard and then allow others to, to chime in. So in March of this year, the Securities and Exchange Commission's then acting chairwoman, Allison Heron Lee, published a request for comment on the SEC's plan to write new rules for corporate disclosure on climate change. That document consisted of 15 detailed questions to which interested parties were invited to respond. It was the final one, however, that signaled what the agency might be actually planning, might be. That was comprehensive rules for corporate conduct, all in compliance with policies that were in question. Commissioner Lee wrote, quote, in addition to climate related disclosure, the staff is evaluating a range of disclosure issues under the heading of environmental, social and governance or ESG matters. Again, just to refresh ourselves, environment refers to all of the soft corporate targets related to pollution, energy, and material use. Governance includes every angle of how corporations are managed and organized. And social, our topic for today, covers any political issue or behavior that affects large numbers of people in a company. So my question, Richard, is when we talk about addressing ESG concerns, how would you frame the viewpoint, the, 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 the pessimistic viewpoint, that, there, that this is a blank check for the SEC to regulate anything its, rat, its, member, its members want according to their values. How do we put this seemingly valid concern of the SEC into the context of human reality? And how do we make sure that this rolls out in a way that is, that is adapting to the times and allowing free market innovation to take place? Thanks, Joe, that's, uh, that's a big question. And uh, I think, uh, I think I actually have, uh, I would say, the more optimistic view, which is that uh, the market response to these concerns will eventually be better than what the SEC comes up with. So, you know, the SEC is there to, uh, you know, make sure we have uh, fair markets. It's there to contribute to uh, capital formation and uh, to keep, you know, investors safe from from fraud. Uh, what I think the current leadership, especially uh, Commissioner Lee would like is for the SEC to have a completely different mission. <laughs> um, the problem is Congress has not authorized the SEC to have a different mission. Um, so these rules that are probably likely coming soon responsive to that, that March 15th notice you mentioned 
uh, will, in the first instance, probably focus on climate change because that was the, the, the bulk of what was addressed and announced then. But as you said, towards the end, uh, Commissioner Lee uh, hinted that we would have a comprehensive ESG framework that would, comp that would uh, at least probably expect public firms to disclose a big list of uh, different kind of information and may, as been hinted in other places, uh, extend even to, to private firms potentially, even though that's, again, not traditionally what the SEC uh, has done. Uh, the problem I think with uh, the, the S in particular, the sort of social issues that we're talking about today is that there is no obvious right answer to many of these issues. Um, most of them are issues that don't have a pro or anti, there, there's not a left side and a right side. Uh, there's no obvious sides, much less a single obvious correct solution. Uh, you know, what's the correct solution for corporations for, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion? Well, every industry and every firm has come up with a, a different answer to that. Uh, you know, and especially with uh, global firms, and we're obviously in a, a global industry here, um, both certainly in the globe and the, the companies that are participating in it, uh, the, the cultural norms are, are very different when it comes to uh, things like, uh, you know, gender diversity and uh, proper gender roles. So if the, if the SEC, for example, or other regulatory bodies want to issue a set of rules that cover everything that is ESG, and especially the controversial social issue, issues that fall under the S, they're going to have to take sides and uh, pick what the right perspective is and what the wrong perspective is. I think that's going to be controversial, it's going to be divisive, and it's not ultimately uh, going to be successful. What we can have instead though is the equivalent in ESG frameworks and standards and disclosure to what we have in the market itself, in products and services, which is competition between firms and industries and national norms. Uh, companies that do a better job managing these social issues will be, I think, more successful, will be more popular with their workers, there'll be better places to work. And all of that information will be studied, will be exchanged at conferences, will be known, will be covered in the media. And the best responses, the best standards will rise to the top. And I think, as you sort of hinted, you know, will, will the SEC's rules be responsive? Well, <laughs> no law or regulation will ever be as responsive as voluntary actions in a given industry will be. It's, thank you, uh, Richard. This is Lou. Um, I'm going to actually read something that you wrote um, in a report that you issued in May, um, which was on the topic of ESG, the, subtitled Diffusing a Major Threat to Shareholder Rights. So you were, you were very specific about where you were going there. Yeah, you said in recent years, environmental, social, and governance theory has become increasingly influential in the world of corporate management and investing, uh, despite significant problems with inconsistent definitions, as, as you've just said, and controversial policies, many proponents, including members of Congress and the Biden administration here in the USA, are suggesting that ESG goals be mandated via government enforcement. Such mandates would constitute a major threat to the property, due process, and association rights of investors, but can be avoided. I mean, here's the good news. If policymakers embrace a voluntary system of benefit corporation charters augmented by private certification standards. I'm going to get back to you and ask you what that means, benefit corporation charters augmented by private certification standards, because I think that's, that's your opening here. Um, but I, I, want to, I want to throw that quote over to first... Uh, Doug and then Tony uh, to get their response on it and uh, what you heard uh, our friend Richard say previously. Doug, why don't we start with you? Yeah, <clears throat> happy to start on that one. Um, you know, look, I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, right, I think as, you know, from an investment banking perspective in Wall Street, you know, we put a lot of emphasis um, on this so much so that like other firms we have our own sustainable impact vesting team that focuses on on these issues, both the, you know, all three letters, and I know we're focusing on the S today. Um, look, I mean, yeah, that's a tough question. I think it's something that's still evolving. 
Um, and I think it's something that, you know, we continue to debate uh, as, we, as we bring on clients and as we go through even individual transactions with existing clients. And so I think, um, yeah, I think <laughs> to, to, to use the pun, the, the ink is still uh, waiting to dry on the paper here. And so I think it's very situational and um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear what others have to say, but it's, uh, it's definitely a topic that's thrown around a lot and discussed a lot um, within our firm. Yeah. Uh, Tony, um, what legal challenges might a company that wants to embrace, you know, uh, this encounter uh, early in the process? I mean, uh, what, will mandates actually work or will they just be challenged endlessly by companies like Barclays that, you know, doesn't see this necessarily as their mission in life. You're muted that... there, Anthony. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Sorry about that. Thanks, Lou. So it, it might start by just, just uh, highlighting several different levels of commitment that a company can have towards the ESG goals. You know, so one of them is, is, creating a public benefit corporation. We'll talk about that legal aspect of that for a second, but there are also things that are short of a full PBC. Uh, so for example, a company can be a normal company that might, um, as a matter of its good business practices, the industry it's in, might have ESG goals. It might become certified as a B corporation by B Lab. It might get a certification of adoption of transparency and sustainability standards under Delaware law. Uh, and that's sort of an intermediate stage in the sense that you're not chartering your corporation specifically to be ESG. And then, you know, there's also an element of ESG where a normal company doing normal things might have ESG pricing adjustments for its debt. And so that's something where ESG can come in in a particular context. Uh, focusing on, on and, and all of these pose the basic, the same variations of the same basic legal issues. Um, so, um, you know, thinking about a, a public benefit corporation, you know, a clear issue there is, um, you know, what fiduciary duties the directors have, can they be sued for not taking into account the interests of constituencies other than the shareholders? Uh, can they be sued for not appropriately taking into account the fiduciary duties to the shareholders? And that of course becomes a slightly different analysis if you have a company that isn't a, a PBC, but it's a normal company. Uh, you have appraisal rights of shareholders, if, particularly if a company converts into a public benefit corporation, um, how can shareholders who don't wanna go for the ESG ride uh, um, get out, how do they get priced? Uh, how do they get, get rights to, to get bought out? Um, you also have a, a lot of reporting and disclosure requirements that, that would appear under state law or and under SEC law, depending upon the kind of business and the, whether it's public. And a key issue in, in when you're talking about disclosure in, is um, what liability there is for so-called greenwashing. Yeah, and greenwashing is a term uh, that I think Greta Thunberg made uh, famous uh, at the uh, COPAC uh, conference, where basically you're providing false or misleading information to convey the impression that a company or a product is more responsible or meets sustainability criteria better than it can. And you know this can be uh, you know, an issue in, in terms of of uh, putting aside SEC disclosure rules, you can have greenwashing liability if you simply you're, you're materially misstating or you're creating materially misleading disclosure on something. And, and sometimes the disclosures can be extremely interrelated and, and difficult to, uh, to really work out. Um, you know, so, so there is that, that liability. Um, I hope that that, that uh, covered the main, yep. the main points. No, thank you. Joe? Yeah, so um, we have some very interesting perspectives here. We have an investment bank, we have a lawyer, we have a think tank, and we have an industry person, uh, Sabrina. 
can it seems like the rubber really hits the road when it comes down to the company that has the PL. Can you talk about the approach that SES takes to the S, particularly in ESG? And this is a organization of individuals. So I think the, the topic is probably pretty timely. What, what is different in the way ESG thinking has come into the way people are managed and, uh, and, and weighed into the equation, both within the company, customers, and the community? Sure. So um, firstly, I'm going to give you a European perspective as well on just kind of what you mentioned beforehand. In Europe, we are about to be forced to actually report on ESG standards. Um, and what that, then that will also be audited. And what that also means is that companies don't have a choice but to incorporate ESG values within their business. And so taking a step back a bit, SES um, realized about a year ago that ESG is really crucial for the survival of a company long term. It's something that we should be doing in general, and it's something that we can't just talk about and greenwash or do on an ad hoc basis, but we need some form of strategy around it. And so from that, we have been working very closely with internal, external stakeholders, with consultants who have helped us frame our strategy um, and actually work together to understand what are the material issues within the company? What is it that our stakeholders find that are so important that we as a company need to focus on, but also leverage our products and services and the way we do business to make a better impact on the world? And so with all of these in mind, um, over the course of about nine months, uh, we have come up with a strategy and, and that incorporates four pillars. One is space sustainability, and that's very industry specific. The next is about climate action and then critical human needs and diversity and inclusion. So the last two very much are focused on this S and it's about, you know, what do we do within our company uh, externally as well and within the industry, but also what do we, how can we leverage our products and services to actually make an impact? And it was quite interesting watching the video at the beginning because that's exactly the mission that SCS are going for here. You know, we want to connect the unconnected. We want to help those in, in remote areas. We wanna provide um, connectivity, especially to women who are not able to usually get that sort of education. Um, and what that has meant is that the business mentality has had to shift. And ESG and business can sometimes be thought of as separate, but actually it's not. ESG is your business. If you wanna survive as a business, ESG has to be the thinking point here. Um, if you want your investors, your customer, your customers to think of you as a good company to do business with, um, yeah, this is it, it. All comes together. Uh, so every stakeholder within the company is on board. We hope, um, and you know, we've been working with uh, seniors within the department. We've been driving employee engagement initiatives as well to get them one upskilled within ESG. Um, understanding what are the UN development, uh, sustainable development goals, what is ESG to SES, how does it also help our business and align with our business objectives. Um, and so with those mechanisms in place, the mentality has allowed the culture to adapt towards a more ESG view and how we can actually operate our business and make sure ESG values, business values are go hand in hand together. Um, Sabrina, one quick follow-up question: have, yeah. Has you seen the have you seen the attitude in the company being one of oh we have to do ESG and it's going to cost us money, or do you see it being oh we get to do ESG under this guidance or imperative, and it's going to give us the opportunity to be even more productive and profitable? So it's a bit of both, and it really depends who you talk to. I mean, some people have had the mentality as this is going to be expensive or this is gonna be a big investment, which it is. Let's not take that away from the table here. I mean, if you do wanna report, if you do uh, work on these initiatives, you have to fund it as well, and you have to fund the resources. Um, so there has been that concern, which has kind of been um, watered down by the opposite side, which is where people are like, thank goodness we are finally doing ESG related initiatives. Thank goodness that we are actually taking this seriously. We have a dedicated team. We have a strategy. We know what targets and metrics we need to go by. And we know what us as a department have to, have to do to reach that. 
Um, and so I would say that, you know, it, we're, we're fairly new within where we are in the strategy, but I would say that as time goes on, the more people we get engaged, the more we talk about it, the more we also show the financial benefits, um, people are taking that second mentality where they're really excited and they're like, we get to do this, we're in a position to do this. And we want to also influence the industry as well and, and show that it's possible and everyone can and should be doing this. Um, so so okay. one last point that I'm going to turn over to Lou. As you're going through, this sounds really great. Has the accounting department picked it up to actually be able to do some kind of an ROI calculation on it? You know, you, it, this is very early on in a very embryonic process, which is why we're taking it on. If it were old and established, we would not be doing it here. We take on stuff that's cutting edge. But have like the accounting people thought about looking at it from the standpoint of showing quantitatively the ROI and maybe even using that to push additional investment into this direction? Yeah, so I would, you know, if I'm honest, at the moment, not yet. And that's purely because of where we are in the strategy. Uh, as we start implementing actions, as we start engaging more and more with our external stakeholders, then that is the plan. And actually, you know, the finance team are, are already ready to go and to do this. And from an investment standpoint as well, um, our teams are all ready to go. Everyone's fired up. Everyone knows this is important. And this is coming and this is, you know, the kind of long term plan. Um, so I would say it's definitely something we're looking at, but it's not something we can 100% do properly at this stage. Um, but that's not to say that there's no money in incorporating ESG. If you actually look at the figures that you can find readily available online, you can see that investors are, are really asking for this, which is also, and sorry if I'm taking too much time here, but which is also a really important factor in what SCS are doing. We have had numerous customers say to us, we need your ESG data. We need to know what you are doing for the benefit of the world. We need to know, you know what, is, what are your emissions um, and the same from investors as well. And so we're getting this question all the time in all of our sales pitches now, ESG needs to be a huge part of it. And so we can already see you know, maybe not with numbers, but actually from, from these conversations, like from a financial perspective, incorporating ESG is really crucial. And Sabrina, one, one point that I would make just to follow up on, on this, or I'd like to raise the question and see what people think about this, is that the satellite industry is particularly well suited to compete on the basis of S mm -hmm. because so much of the, the things that the industry does uh, help inclusion, financial inclusion, um, population advancement, sort of like we saw in, in, the, in the earlier uh, um, film. There might be some challenges on the E side with respect to you know, liftoff capacity and, and toxic fuels. And mm -hmm. if you consider space debris as an E issue, uh, there's also an issue with, with space debris. But I think that the satellite industry um, right away is sort of a leg up on the S because you can look at what most satellites are doing and map the activity or satellite companies and map the activities to you know, the UN Sustainability Development Goals as articulated for space by ESA and by NASA. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And actually this has been great for us because we've already been doing so much. And you know where this strategy come, comes from is that we need a program around it. We don't want to keep doing this as, on an ad hoc basis. We want to be doing this under the ESG umbrella. We want initiatives going forward. We want a structured program. And we want to not just do the minimum we can do, but actually enhance what we're already doing as a company, which is why you know, when you say we have a step up on that S, it's 100% true. But we need to show that rather than just talk about ad hoc case studies here and there, um, which is why the strategy going forward, especially on the S side, is so important. There's also so much that we can do. It's more where do we focus our company? How do we, how do we go about it? Who do we want to impact? How do we want to impact? And so there has to be a lot of thought behind this, the way you're, about, you're going to do it and where you're targeting. Very good. Well, it's you know good to know that the the industry is well thought of uh, in this regard. Um, but Richard, I I'm I'm looking at you and Doug on this. Um, you know, I'm picking up a phrase that Sabrina 
said, business mentality has had to shift. Maybe the assumption there is that there was something wrong with business inherently so that you need this, this change of consciousness. I don't know if I heard much that was voluntary in this as well which might be disturbing if I'm uh, an entrepreneur or Doug, if I'm thinking about my shareholders. So does any of that um, sound problematic to you, Richard? I'll start with you. And I think <clears throat> there's, you know, two main ways to, to look at this about, you know, corporate social responsibility and you know, the, the sort of the new version of corporate social responsibility, which is the ESG framework, which is do businesses come into this with a moral deficit or with the expectation of moral neutrality. So, you know, some industry critics would say that, you know, just going out there and being profit driven means that you have some sort of moral deficit that you need to make up for by giving back to society or doing some additional philanthropy or embracing some of these other ESG initiatives. Um, I would say, as long as you're selling legal products and services to willing buyers, you are at no deficit whatsoever. And you don't need to buy your legitimacy back with additional initiatives. You may want to do any number of things and it may be a great idea to do um, you know, uh, a whole list of things that fall under the ESG umbrella. That doesn't mean those are bad ideas, but I don't think that <clears throat> it's not required. It shouldn't be the ethical assumption that every for-profit corporation needs to buy its legitimacy back just because they're a for-profit corporation. Um, but I would quickly uh, call back one thing go back to one thing that Joe said, which is it's sort of a pushback a little bit on this, uh, which is that this is new and it's cutting edge and this is something that, you know, we're, that companies only very recently have had to worry about. Um, I don't think that's true at all. I think there's been a very old conversation about uh, corporations should do more than just be corporations. Um, going back, I mean, in my opinion, probably about a hundred years, but certainly at least to the middle of the 20th century. And uh, like I said, if, if you if you look at phrases like corporate social responsibility, you know that phrase was invented by a management scholar uh, Howard Bowen in 1953 when he wrote a now famous treatise on corporate management called the, the Social Responsibilities of the Businessman. And there was the company um, town. Remember that concept? Yes. Yeah. So there are a lot of versions of this, and uh, it's changed from you know the mid you know mid 20th century, which was much more sort of technocratic and corporatist and big. Uh, big entity focused uh, through the 1970s when people began being concerned more about environmental issues. Um, and then, you know, eventually in the last, you know, say 25 years, we've had more concern with, um, you know, uh, LGBT Americans and uh, uh, diversity in the workplace for all sorts of people and groups that have been uh, traditionally underappreciated. Uh, so it's certainly evolved, but a lot of the, the underlying impulse behind ESG today and ESG activism and frameworks and policies, I think is actually very old. Um, people, a lot of people are concerned that big financially large enterprises um, be accountable to society in some general way. And they certainly like it when those companies do socially beneficial things that aren't directly tied to their bottom line. Um, but the ESG, discussion we have today is only, in my view, a slightly updated version of one we've been having for a very long time in this country. Right. And Doug, again, this, this falls in your lap as well, right? Because shareholders are looking at this. Uh, innovation depends on it. I mean, you can, you can really put a grind on innovation if you start mandating things that have nothing to do with the core mission of a capitalist company, which is to create wealth and to create jobs. Um, again, is that is any of this problematic or is SES sort of a model going forward for, for companies that are going to be seeking funding? Well, and I'm not um, picking on you, Sabrina, I'm not picking on you. But <laughs> no, I, 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 think, uh, I think SES is a model. I think that is the trend that you're seeing. I think the premise of your question to begin with was, um, do, people like, do, do people like mandates? Um, and, and we've seen it for a very obvious reason, right? I think people tend to, and businesses probably tend to not like to be forced to do things. But I think, um, I think today there's, there's this wave, and, and, and Richard, to your point, I know this is not a new phenomenon with this ESG, and I was reading some of the 
articles that were put out and research reports that, you know, this is not anything new. I think what is different now and, and you know, from my personal opinion is that there's, um, there's just a great shift to doing good in general. Um, and, and I want to reiterate, Richard, what you said, just because we're in this new wave and this new shift of ESG and, 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 and the social aspect of it, it doesn't mean that the companies yesterday uh, uh, compared to today are bad, right? They're not bad. They're just learning to transform and they're trying to be better companies while also tying it to profits. And, you know, Sabrina, you said yourself, you know, the accounting department hasn't tied that to financials or to valuation or profitability yet. It's getting there and it probably will get there. Um, but, but I think it is very important. And as we look at companies uh, going forward, especially on um, you know, private earlier stage companies, space companies, future tech companies, um, future transportation, what have you, right? I, I think if you just think about it from a capital raising perspective, you also open up a whole new subset of investors. And it could be investors within current, um, you know, large investment funds that have a specific ESG focus or an ESG fund, which can open up additional funds, which can help you grow your company where you already have kind of an ESG framework that you're looking to promote, whether, you know, a lot of it tends to be from, from the E side now, and then as well as incorporating the S side um, to the investment. And I, and I think it's, again, the summation is you're creating a good company, you're trying to do well by society, and you're also attracting funds through an ESG effort that, you know, isn't, is helping your bottom line and helping you develop your, your technology and improve out your business model. Sorry. And Doug, and Doug one, 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 one thing I would say, just to follow up on what you said is that there is, I think, a, a, a bottom up groundswell of in, investor interest, I'm thinking mom and pop investor interest in ESG stuff. Uh, it started with E, but it's sort of become uh, more. And, and you see this in the investment management industry, where I would say that the investment management industry was, has been talking about ESG for two and a half or three years, but it's only in the last 12 or 18 months that you've seen large mutual fund complexes, investment advisor complexes, really making a, a strong commitment. You know, BlackRock is, is the, the poster child of this and, and making a, a strong commitment to, to ESG in their investment offerings. And I think it's because they're being told by their mutual fund investors, we want an ESG uh, uh, opportunity. You know, in the, um, and I think one thing that an interesting data point, you know, that relates to this growth is that according to Morningstar, um, in the first quarter of this year, ESG proxy proposals uh, that, that gained support, that won, the percentage grew from 36% to 44%. So you've seen sort of an increase in voting, much of which is by the same mutual funds that own shares. You've seen um, an increase in the sustainable debt finance market uh, in, in 2020 of 29%, of which social bonds grew seven times from $21 billion to $147 billion in that one year. Hmm. And so to your point, Doug, I think that you're seeing a just a, a, a change in the at, at, appetite of the people who are the ultimate investors. And the last point, since I'm a lawyer, I'll just mention that the Department of Labor has recently issued a, a proposed a rule that would uh, issued a proposed rule that would, if, if adopted, make it easier for ERISA fiduciaries to take into account ESG factors uh, and sort of give them, you can say, uh, equal billing with the with the economic factors. And if that proposed rule becomes final, you can see um, more momentum uh, as, as ERISA plans are, are being um, directed more into ESG. So um, yeah, I, I want to just add that footnote to your comments. Yeah. Joe, I'm just going to jump in because it was occurring to me, is, is Tony, is this generational? Is, it, is this possibly a generational move? 
I mean, I, I know everyone on the panel is very young, but is, is this something that is a mentality that is driving, or, is the, or are the demographics driving uh, the desire um, to you know, create a better satellite world this way? I'm gonna come in here and just say that I think <laughs> it does contribute quite a lot. Um, you know, with the use of social media, uh, it's become a huge thing. So media opens up everything. Everyone mm -hmm. wants to know about everything, have uh, accessibility to information. So now if they know a company's doing bad, it's going to be on social media. People aren't going to want to go to them when they know someone else is doing the complete opposite thing. Um, and I do, I don't want to say it's generational because I'm sure every generation thinks about their impact in one way or another or who they're working for. Um, and the business that they operate in. But I do want to say that the transparency is kind of a, it's, it's a necessity at this point because everyone, everyone wants to know everything behind the business now. Um, and you can't get away from it as soon as it's recorded, as soon as it's on there, it spreads like wildfire. So um, I definitely do think that the combination of, you know, technology advances and uh, has influenced the the, um, the generation for sure hmm. why people are caring quite a lot yeah joe i wanted to go back to your um, <clears throat> to your points anthony and just to reiterate anthony's with the new york office of knl gates um one of my first questions is how big is i guess what i would call the esg practice how much of the firm's time is wrapped up in cases that relate to esg and then secondly you know, if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm running a business, is this another, you know, a risk facet that I have to face? I mean, it's sure there's opportunity economically. I get that and I'm with that. But I'm, I'm, especially in the S area, am I now also much more susceptible to lawsuits because of either direct or indirect uh, expectations for ESG performance? Yeah. So to answer your first question, uh, my, my firm, we have about 2000 lawyers practicing and a lot of areas, including renewable energy, corporate, and ESG issues, and, and investment management, uh, among others. And ESG issues have become more and more front and center for us um, over the past few years, sometimes in some cases in a particular letter and for a longer period, like in our renewable energy practice. Um, but but like the market as a whole, we, we've been seeing greater interest in this. To your second question, yeah, it certainly does. It's a new paradigm and it does create new opportunities, but also new liabilities. I mean, for example, in my finance practice, I'm doing a lot of work with borrowers who are being offered the possibility to have pricing adjustments to their credit facilities or their bonds, depending upon their, their meeting predefined sustainability targets and e typically in one or in two of the three letters and um, and and this sort of creates some interesting dynamics i mean there's one case where we had a client who was very strong on e had a, was in the business was very good on e and it was offered uh, a pricing adjustment and as it negotiated it it turned out that it wasn't as good on s and g and it would actually be net dinged um, even though it had a great E story. So it didn't take the pricing adjustment. And so that's sort of one example of where something that seemed like it was going to be a great positive actually showed a, uh, you know, some, I won't say deficiencies, but showed some, some uh, uh, areas where they couldn't get, get good, good pricing. Um, you also have a lot of li liability issues, you know, particularly for public companies, um, or, or, or companies that are doing hedges and have to report their hedges to the CFTC around greenwashing. And you know you, you have, and you think of greenwashing as just fraud, you're just lying about what you do, but it's actually a very, uh, can be a very difficult thing to, to draw lines in. I mean, just to take an example, it's not an S example, but an E example. If you have a, an electric car company and it has electric batteries. I mean, this is great, electric batteries. But then when you look at the electric battery, um, whether it it's uses cobalt or it uses lithium, you then look at how the cobalt and the lithium is mined. And there are some significant uh, 
environmental issues there. And also with lithium, maybe with cobalt, but it's certainly with lithium, there are also significant social issues because lithium is a, um, is a conflict mineral. And so it's sort of like peeling an onion or you know, whatever analogy you wanna have, but you, you, you do well on one metric, but then when you peel down, you might find that there are uh, sort of the butterfly effect where as you peel down, you discover that there are externalities elsewhere that are, that are negative. And so it can be a very, very tricky thing. And this example shows it can also be an area where you could get into difficulties with how you, um, how you describe, how you disclose, how you measure uh, something, if it turns out that there's a, a negative externality down the road. Yeah. Um, Richard, does that sort of suggest your, I, I think, idea that we, we move ultimately toward voluntarily driven uh, certification standards so that we kind of all know and are playing by the same rules here? Um, I, I mean, is that the process? It starts with these kind of mandates. Good, be, good companies like SES, you know, pick it up, play around with it, you know, get the model right. And then there's this voluntary notion that gets us back to a market-driven um, approach. I think ultimately, if you want to have improvement, and of course, a lot of a lot of people now are saying, at least the current generation of ESG is still new, um, or at least is an updated uh, version of the previous uh, CSR visions, that uh, we haven't got it right yet, we don't know all the answers yet, which of course is true, but if you ever want to get to better answers, I think you need competition. And so not just competition between firms for market share, but competition for firms for the best ESG practices. And you're not going to get competition if you have SEC regulation of that. Um, you, as this often happens in, in regulation, uh, that the regulation becomes a ceiling instead of a floor, which is to say companies will spend just as much time and energy as they absolutely have to, to meet those regulations and not go above it. Because then of course they have the response whenever they're asked, oh, well, we do everything to meet government regulations. Yes, but you know, they will have much less incentive to do more or to do better. So if you want an iterative process that involve, that creates innovation and better outcomes, I think you have to have some kind of competition, uh, which is exactly why central control uh, is the worst way to go about that. That's almost guaranteeing that you won't get gradual improvements or you know, even better, dramatic improvements uh, going forward. So I, I think we need for best results in a, a voluntary framework, but I also think there will probably be some place somewhere where advocates of regulation will, uh, will, you know, will get some wins. There will probably be more than we have now, hopefully not a lot more. Um, but the question is, how should that regulation be guided? And I think you want a, a factual basis <laughs> more than anything else. Uh, to go back to what Tony was saying, there is absolutely uh, going to be increased risk corporate-wise um, from dramatically expanding the disclosures. And again, the, the letter from uh, Commissioner Lee of the SEC from March of this year suggested there might be a rather dramatic increase in required public company disclosures, um, you know, and maybe not even just public companies. But everything you disclose uh, uh, puts you at legal risk if someone comes along after the fact and says, oh no, that wasn't quite right. So if you're all of a sudden disclo officially disclosing as a, as a public registered firm under the SEC, 10 times as much information, well, that's 10 times more risk. And then on the back end, 10 times more work for everyone in the council's office to make sure that everything, all the, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed and that you try and minimize that risk. So this is, you know, as we said, it's an opportunity, but it's, also potentially a threat, which is why we needed to divide it between things that are factual and that you can misstate and things that simply are not in that category and cannot be regarded as uh, a, a material misstatement. So the, the Federal Trade Commission, just as one sort of amusing example, when it comes to companies advertising their products, you know, you are not allowed to say anything in your ads that is factually incorrect, of course not but you can say things that are not amenable to falsification. So if you are a company that makes hot dogs, you can say, we have the most delicious hot dogs in the world. Now, 
people might disagree. Your competitors, I'm sure, would disagree about the level of deliciousness between the two products. But because that is uh, not a quantitative statement, it is inherently a qualitative judgment that cannot be falsified, it's perfectly allowable. The FTC allows companies to do that. So I think there's some parallel to ESG claims, which is if you say we're doing an, you know, an excellent job on rainwater remediation or whatever it happens to be, and then you have a description of what it is your company's doing. As long as there are no material misstatements, there's nothing actually incorrect there, then I think a reasonable regulatory perspective would say, well, this is a matter of judgment and we're going to let investors decide. We're going to make, let analysts decide. You know, a lot of individual investors will defer to reports issued by analysts and that that's just, that's the competition. That's how it goes. Um, whilst maintaining uh, the important job of punishing companies that do actually lie. And, uh, you know, we, we live in an imperfect world and uh, occasionally that happens. So that is an important law enforcement and consumer protection job that the SEC and groups like the FTC also do uh, that we, we need to maintain. But we need to make some distinction between things that are amenable to that sort of enforcement and things that just simply aren't. So Doug, a, a looser grip, so to speak, which would then allow more social innovation. Does that make sense to you? For me, yeah, it does. Yep. Definitely does. Okay. Sabrina, does that make sense to you? Yes. Um, yep. Yeah. yeah, it does. But I mean, again, because I come from a European, you, you know, where where the mentality is different. Um, when we when we talk about enforcement, when we talk about mandates, mandatory audits, it, you know, this is something that okay, we're tackling at the moment. There's a lot of confusion and challenge uh, on right now. But I mean, how do you expect companies to start if there is nothing in place to enforce it? And you talk about competition, yes, and that's a huge part of why a lot of companies incorporate ESG. But at least from the reporting side of things, if no one knows what you're doing because you're not reporting it and it's not made mandatory to report it, then how mm -hmm. and to know everything that's actually going on from an ESG point of view? Um, and so I, I think that's a huge thing. And that, you know, that ties into business performance, uh, investor relation, um, but also the, the kind of talent that you attract as well. Uh, if people, we've had so many people come to SES who have just said, I just love the fact that you actually focus on ESG and that you do work around it and emphasize the importance of it. And that's the only way you're gonna get diverse talent to actually make your empire even stronger than it is. Um, so I think that to some extent there needs to be a level of kind of enforcement in terms of ESG values or how you report on them at least. I agree if you're being told you have to have X, Y, Z, okay, fine, that could create problems in, on the other end of things because you, know, you, you want people to, to do as best as they can, not meet the minimum criteria. Um, but, but there needs to definitely be that balance. I don't think we've found it yet. And I think with the explosion of ESG conversations, um, in time, we should definitely find it. Um, but I also believe that international cooperation is vital for this because companies don't really just operate anymore in one country or in one area. Um, and once we're all aligned on that, I think it'll make it a lot easier for companies and their entities to actually uh, incorporate ESG in a way that benefits all rather than just a few. Yeah, and of course, transparency, which you referred to earlier yeah. is gonna be fundamental here. Um, well, Joe, they're all, they're kind of just agreeing with each other, which, you know, okay. We wasn't sure we wanted that, but, uh, I'm being facetious, but um, a very good discussion. Uh, Joe, did you have a, a question before we go to audience Q&A? Uh, no questions. I think I just, wanted, I just wanted to look back a moment. I think it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate everybody. And we're going to transition into questions from the audience, so to speak, right now. But I wanted to just offer a couple of reflections. You know, there were some really good points made about the market being more effective at regulating this than the SEC, that if, if a agencies like the FCC were to take this on, they would be actually changing their mission. We talked about the idea of the public benefit corporation as an option for people or, or groups that want to actually make ESG a, a, a larger part of what they're doing as opposed to serving shareholders. 
Um, we talked about you know, some of the unique perspectives relative to um, the legal aspects. And I really, Anthony, you'll be getting a call from me to become my new ESG lawyer. Sounds like there's great opportunities there to really, you know, think forward about how to protect the business in this way. And also, you know, from Doug's perspective, looking at how um, an investment bank weighs ESG into the investment decision was an interesting conversation. Um, I've learned the term greenwashing, so I'm going to be careful I don't fall, uh, fall for greenwashing. And I found it interesting how uh, Sabrina's presentation talked about the fact that she is in a European ecosystem and how culturally dependent this will be. It actually made me think maybe even in the US, ESG regulations will come down to the local level, not just be one blanket rule across the whole country. This idea of, of SES and others looking at this as something they get to do versus something they have to do. And then the idea of looking at BlackRock, as was stated here, as a poster child for taking ESG to a certain level of you know, rigor and seriousness. Um, and I just want to mention to everybody that Richard has produced a couple of really fantastic reports that we've placed in the chat. And he actually has, if you can see that, a hard copy of this book he's willing to send to you if you drop your, uh, your uh, address information into the chat. Yeah. And Richard, if you don't mind putting your email uh, in here as well, so that people yeah, can request that report. It's a, it's a terrific report. It's about, about 110 pages, but it's a, a really, really good read and a lot of the ideas. Uh, that he spoke of today are incorporated here and elaborated on. Um, before, Tam, I'm going to turn it back to you to, to go through audience questions. Does Is anybody else promoting anything here? Um, we didn't ask beforehand of Sabrina or Anthony or Doug. Uh, well, Anthony, sounds like you just got a new client, so that's good for you. Um, <laughs> is Barclays doing anything, Doug, that we need to be aware of or that we can look at or read? or? Uh, Nothing in particular, just what I said before. Look, uh, you know, just want a, a shameless plug on our sustainable impact investment team. Um, I think it's one of the top on the streets. Uh, and it's been a focus of ours formally as a specific coverage group since 2019. So would love to, to meet anyone out there who needs uh, our help. Yeah, and Sabrina, of course, SES continues to launch and operate satellites, connect the world. And do yeah. many virtuous things. Its Empower platform is beginning to get traction. Anything you wanted to say in your term? Yeah, well, I was just going to say, you know, we're launching our kind of next generation of satellites, O3B Empower. The O3B actually stands for the other three billion, um, which kind of comes back to the whole ESG and the social impact because that's the aim. We want to uh, connect the unconnected, um, and we're doing that. And we are launching our new satellites very very soon. Um, so keep an eye out for it. Enjoy the launches. Um, and, you know, please get in touch if you do have any questions, uh, ESG related or, or uh, SES related. And what is the size of, uh, of SES's fleet now? Um, I need to double check. We have okay. so many uh, at the moment. Um, but we're also, of course, keeping in mind the environmental impact. Uh, we are, and also which kind of orbit we want to be in at the moment. Um, exactly, yeah. That's kind of why I asked that. Everybody's yeah. going to lose count eventually. Um, yeah. Um, Anthony, anything? Uh, will you be appearing or speaking or writing anything that K, uh, from for k &L Gates that um, we need to be aware of? Um, I, I, I routinely write and speak on a variety of legal issues. Uh, this is my second ESG speaking engagement for in the last uh, three weeks. And I, I, I don't know when I'll be speaking or writing on ESG again, but uh, I also write on aviation finance sometimes. Yep, and KNL Gates is a uh, corporate partner of SSPI. So uh, we'll obviously keep people uh, briefed on what you folks are up to. And I know Richard, you're getting on a plane to go to Charleston, South Carolina to appear. So uh, good luck and uh, have a good flight there. Um, Tamara, why don't we take some questions? I, I know some are coming in. Yeah, before we take questions, I'd like to just give a really quick overview. Um, we, are, we are past the one o'clock mark, and so some people may be dropping off. Before you drop off, I wanna let you know about what's coming up next. Uh, we have a quick change of our schedule. We originally planned to have a environment E discussion next month, but we're revisiting the question of governance. And we've heard some of the questions that 
are pertinent to the uh, issue of governance here in terms of disclosure. We really want to tease out some of those issues a little bit more. And so we're asking the question in December 15th, is Wolf putting profit to sleep? Ha. So we invite you to join us uh, to have that conversation. And on January 19th, speaking of plugging, we're moving the satellite uh, and environment conversation to January because we're having a climate conversation for the entire month. It's gonna run about six weeks starting on the 10th. And so on the 19th, our contribution to that conversation will be satellites, the key to clean profits. We really hope you'll all join us for those events. And one last plug from SSPI before I jump into questions. On, Jan on December 9th, you all saw our Better Satellite World uh, video at the top of the program. On December 9th, we're honoring uh, the winners of the 2021 Better Satellite World Awards. Um, that'll be announced soon. And, uh, and we hope you come out and, and join that celebration. And with that, let's jump into some questions. Um, I wanna read this, this question. This was a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm bypassing my questions to ask audience questions. So Nico Donna from Avison asked this question. So, Advising private equity and other financial investors in space ventures at Avacent, uh, that's Alicia Anderson who's here, uh, as well as Nico. We often see different interpretations on how target investments meet or don't meet the institution's own ESG goal. With an eye to the S in particular, we often see the issue of defense focused revenues come up in different institutions having more or less comfort with space companies enabling defense and intelligence missions, especially when the end customers are not US or NATO members. Are defense applications of space assets to be seen as accretive or detractive to an investment social score? So I turn this over to the moderators to tease this out. Well, I, I'm going to the moder one of the moderators is going to turn it over to one of the panelists. Um, Anthony, you want to take that on? Yeah, I'll I'll uh, I'll start, and then hopefully somebody who knows more can 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 correct me. So I think that uh, that you know this this sort of focuses attention on one of the points that was raised earlier, which is that there is is in, in some respect there is no real consensus on the key performance indicators for various letters. And, and this is a, a great example, like you know, different institutions can view this uh, differently. I think that as, as I mentioned before, I think that you know, one of the, the unique characteristics of the satellite industry is that you are in a, uh, an, an area where there is a lot of governmental and intergovernmental uh, focus on what are appropriate uh, S goals in addition to other letters. And so, you know, I, I think that putting aside the dual use aspect uh, for a second, now I, I think that if you are, if your satellites are doing something that is aligned with the, uh, the, the UN's sustainable development goals in, in, in S, in particular as, 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 uh, uh, as annotated by or, or, or added to by ESA and NASA, I think that there is a good basis to say that you're doing something that is the subject of some consensus that it, it's good. When you have dual use uh, uh, assets, you know you you have a necessary uh, difficulty, and there might be some different judgments made by different people as to where you draw the line of uh, on dual use. In a sense, you know, this sort of reminds me, the dual use issue in the defense reminds me a little bit of some issues that our Islamic finance colleagues in my firm uh, deal with, where, you know, in, in their financings, there are certain industries that are, are forbidden. And sometimes you'll have a, a, uh, the same kind of line drawing exercise as to whether you know, some industry that has a, a dual use that might be good and might be bad, how that gets gets addressed. Um, so uh, I, I succeeded in not answering the question, uh, but hopefully I, I uh, lined it up for one of my colleagues to 
have a more educated response. Well, who has the educated response then? Uh, that was very good, <laughs> I, actually. I, 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 take it. I, I don't know if we call it the educator response, but I think <laughs> if I was looking in the in the chat, I think Philip also answered the, the question as well. And, um, and, and Nico, I appreciate that. It, it is a, something that we, we deal with, especially not just in space, but in aerospace and defense um, as I cover at large. Um, and, and I'll echo what, what was said. You know, there's three types of, of investors, right? There, there's the ones that defense is fine, which obviously no problem there. There's ones that where the defense, uh, they don't want any part of defense in the revenues, which um, there's really, you know, that position is fine as well. And I think, a, you know, a majority of the time is spent in the middle. It's how do you, how do you put your dollars to work or how do you um, market a company with defense revenues and fit it in this, um, you know, as we're talking today in this social aspect. And so I think um, I'll also say that just from a Barclays perspective, whenever we go through any transaction, across aerospace and defense, there is a sustainability team that has, um, we have a defense standard in place, which other banks probably do as well. And so every transaction that we sign up to be a part of or to advise on or, or help uh, in any way goes through this committee. Um, so it's very similar to, you know, an investor putting their dollars to work in, in a company um, as the question stated. And so kind of how we look at it is and how we can justify things and how we can you know meet meet all the parameters is what is the purpose of the technology um you know are there missiles obviously we you know you would have to abide and we abide by any of the you know the accords and the peace accords and the un statements and treaties and so forth um but is it a passive system or is it an offensive system right and i think you would, you know, normally, usually, generally, you could classify most space systems. I mean, think of Earth observation, right? Used for commercial purposes as well as uh, military purposes. Um, not really offensive, right? It's used to collect data. Um, where, but then again, where you use that data, you can walk the dog and you can always kind of put it to where you really want to fundamentally be. But we kind of keep it as high level as we can to justify, all right, it's a passive military system, um, which is okay from a social acceptance policy. Um, and, and, you know, that's just from our experience, how we can, I hate to use the word justify, um, but kind of put that investment and put, you know, our ability to sign up for, for a deal or to provide advice in a way where we can accept some you know, defense exposure. And I think as another thing, and, and I won't hog the mic here, as another thing is, um, you know, as you go around and you meet companies, especially in the earlier stage startup um, for, for space companies, if you will, um, and you just go and you ask, well, what is your revenue makeup today? Even if it's you know, gonna be predominantly a commercial model, you know, where are you getting your source of funds? You know, and a lot of times, you know, say half of them, it'll come from some military funding because that's how they'll get the initial funding to get the re research and development done to build out their technology to eventually shift revenues to be 75% commercial, 25% defense, or, or even all commercial eventually. Um, and so, you know, I think it is important to have you know, some part of defense in there. And I think it's okay, I guess maybe I should say, it's okay to have the discussion around any defense revenue exposure because just peel the onion back, if you will, a little bit and see where is that, where is the, you know, where's the impact gonna be? Is it gonna be, um, you know, uh, socially degrading? Is it gonna be socially uh, not acceptable? Um, to to have that in your investment portfolio, you know, call it eight times out of 10, I don't know, seven times, nine times out of 10, the revenue isn't going to be uh, for a defense purpose where we kind of think of as a, a very, like a missile system, right, or a cluster munition, right? It's not that. 
Does, does that make sense? Nico, did you have a follow-up question? You're on. There you go. Sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't able to unmute myself. No, uh, you know, Anthony Douglas, thanks so much for that. Um, no, I think that is very informative and aligns with sort of what we've seen in different variations having worked kind of pure defense platform deals. Um, you know, like the Airbus pencil kind of uh, spinoff or um, or more sort of remote sensing focused deals like Geost this summer. You know, um, it, it certainly varies. Um, I'm very curious to hear and see how this evolves in coming months, but uh, in coming years with, with new deals and as more and more activities happening in the space arena, I do think that there is a little bit of a education element to, to investors who often think that space lives in a sort of isolated stovepipe, civil, commercial focused um, stack when that is very rarely the case, even if the system is at, uh, sort of passive or uh, further upstream on the on the chain, as you may uh, as you may say. So, no follow ups, but thank you for that. Thanks, Nika. Appreciate it. Sure, um, Joe. Did you have a question? I've got one. Uh, you know, I, I yep. really nothing specific at the moment. Um, okay, I. Um, I just want to I want to ask a question of Sabrina and, and Doug if he wants to answer it. This is this is completely out in left field, but I'm going to tie it somehow to to uh, social because um, that's you know because I'm the moderator. I guess I, I have a I can do that. It, Sabrina, companies and their employees, uh, you know, Blue Origin comes to mind. Continue to show concern or to be made aware of burnout and the approach uh, and even the point of work overall. It's it's amazing what we've seen in society now as this great reassessment uh, takes place, which I'm, I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, researchers like Alex Payne, uh, who we did a podcast with, have been maintaining, he's a Stanford researcher, for those of you who don't know, have been maintaining for a long time, and data now bears it out, that fewer hours, more rest, and greater balance is another key to a successful social environment. Is this an item that has reached your HR or management radar screens as even remotely significant? Yeah, actually, this is a huge part of that S and we have a whole team dedicated to, uh, to the purely mm -hmm. aspect of it. So we have a diversity and inclusion officer uh, who works on uh, the DNI parts of it from all areas, but also uh, we have uh, a mental health officer as well, part of the learning and development team who focuses on mental health, how we can actually as a company um, ensure that all of our employees are supported, that they uh, take time out of their day. And it's funny because you uh, that you mentioned it, where we just got an email um, earlier today about no meeting Wednesdays. Um, so from my time- Really? Yeah, so from my- Camera. <laughs> so from my time, one to 6 p.m., um, they've asked everyone to, to not put any, they've asked us to use that time to actually go for a walk or go to the gym or and finish, make sure we finish work early um, in hopes that employee mental health will improve significantly. People aren't stressed, they have time to, to go about their day. Um, and then part of our ESG strategy that we've launched is something called the ESG Action Groups. Um, so we've actually split, uh, well, I don't want to say the company, but we've got three working groups that people are, employees have signed up to. Um, one is around environmental sustainability, one is around employee well-being, uh, and one is about community engagement. So we are making sure that the employees actually have their say about what programs they want to be launched. Uh, and the employee well-being one is all around, um, you know, burnout, uh, mental health. Um, and so we are taking this very seriously. This has been funded. This has been uh, going on for a long time now. And so uh, it's significant uh, and it's very important. And I think that's why a lot of SESs love working at SES because mm -hmm. they are cared for and they know they are. Um, yeah. Um, you know, gee, I, I, I'm probably asking two of the, the wrong industries, but law and finance, do you guys have anything like that? Uh, in the works? Uh, we do. It's, it's not in the works. It's, it's kind of, it's implemented. Um, I have, uh, 
I have the privilege, I guess you'll say, of I'm actually the associate staffer for the industrials group here at, at Barclays. And so I am, I am in it every day. And, um, you know, apart from you, we have the diversity inclusion and all the hiring that I'm a part of and so forth. But just from your question on work-life balance and, and the work environment, um, you know, as most in investment banking know, you know, it's, it's a very tough environment where hours are incredibly long on the sell side from a coverage perspective and investment banking perspective all the time. And so I think, you know, what COVID, and it just wasn't from COVID, but what COVID has helped us do is become more flexible with our work. Um, so I think, uh, not I think, but we do Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays in the office, um, Wednesdays, Fridays are, you know, at, at home working remotely. Um, so you can take care of things uh, that you need to at home and, and still do your work, uh, which I think adds a lot of uh, flexibility, especially to, from a junior banker perspective. Mm. Um, and then on a daily basis, uh, you know, from a junior banker perspective, you, we monitor the workloads. Uh, and there's intense scrutiny, even from the head of industrials, global industrials, always asks and is monitoring as I'm taking a stronger pulse, you know, how are people's workloads? Are they burned out? Do we need to give them vacation? Uh, do we need to completely remove them and, and not just have a typical investment banking break where you're on vacation on the beach with your laptop, but an actual <laughs> removal from your projects. And so I would say, um, you know, COVID's been a real, uh, a real awakening in that, but I think it's been in place before. It's just even better today, yeah. which is positive, which I really like. Yeah. Tony, I mean, lawyers are, are known notoriously as people who can just grind away for hour after hour after hour. I mean, they're, they're admired for their stamina. Has that, is KNL Gates had to address this issue or are you guys just able to plow through? I think we've had to address it. It's probably been a little bit easier for us than for large institutions like Barclays. And I think that we'll probably be taking our, a lot of our, our cues longer term from how larger uh, institutions are, are, are dealing with this. But I, I think that we've come to appreciate flexibility in a way that we re really hadn't before. I mean, lawyers, you know, we, we would, would routinely work you know, outside of normal business hours, people would normally work at home. Uh, but what's different is that before it was always, you know, when you weren't in the office, you would be working. And now we've realized that you don't actually need necessarily to be in the office to be able to have that productivity. Some of the issues that I, I think I, I've become sensitive to are, um, you know, when people are working at home, like in the lockdown, you know, nonstop, Sometimes you, you, the absence of barriers or boundaries within the day can actually be deleterious where people would start work at seven in the morning because they don't have to commute and they would end work at 10 because mm -hmm. that's when it ends. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one reason why I come into the office every day when I'm in the city because I, for my mental health, it was important to have, have those boundaries. Um, but, the, but the other thing that we, we've seen with, with flexibility, you don't need to. Um, well, well, you don't. You don't need to be, you know, necessarily everybody in at all the time at the same time. We're also trying to figure out. Well, how do we maintain mentorship? How do we maintain a sense a sense of community? Um, and 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 we're we're learning things um, about how we we can do that hopefully more effectively than before in the new environment. Yeah. Yeah. As I mentioned, Alex Pang has a terrific book called Rest. Um, uh, just outstanding. You know, Joe. Just, just a minute, sir. gentlemen, um, because we are at 125. The meeting will end in five minutes. And so I just want to give us that advance notice. Very good. Um, you know, Joe, I was thinking Mussolini used to have all of his meetings standing up and they didn't last longer than 15 minutes. He probably is not the role model we want to assume here, but it's an interesting discussion. Well, this has been a, no, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate what I would just call the courageousness of everyone to take this on. Um, as Richard said, you know, this, this general idea has been around for a while, but we just had the sense that there's something new about this. 
And, you know, to me, it really boils down to the fact that there are a lot of people of goodwill in the space industry who really want to serve the common good. And the question is, what is the optimal way to organize our corporations to do that from a financial standpoint, a legal standpoint, an HR standpoint? So, you know, I, I see everybody here who's our panelists, our, our guests, all as pioneers in this area. And I would encourage everyone to, you know, fire questions at us anytime. Our esteemed uh, panelists here, I'm sure, would be happy to engage. And the purpose of SSPI and, and uh, NYSA coming together on this is really to try to enrich the community. We don't come with an agenda. We don't come to convince you of anything. But we do bring top-notch speakers like this together to tackle subjects that we think are really going to matter to the bottom line and formation of businesses. And we hope you tell your friends because we do this every third Wednesday. Uh, and of course, we're considering going back to the physical space um, in 2022. So we're going to, you know, keep our eye on Dr. Fauci and others to see what they have to say about whether we can do this. Um, With drinks and hors d'oeuvres, okay? Absolutely. Little hot dogs. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> little hot dogs. Uh, I want to thank Richard Morris and Richard had to get on that plane to go to Charleston. He had mentioned that to us, but uh, we really appreciate him participating. I also want to give a big shout out to Tamara Bond Williams, our membership director here at SSPI. Uh, she's produced this event and organized it. And uh, Tamara, we, we can't do this without you. So um, congratulations. And if anyone wants to become a member of SSPI and you're not already or a corporate partner, uh, see Tamara about that. We'd love to have you. We we don't do this um, without your support. And also uh, Matt Owen, who you don't see, who's also behind the scenes uh, running the technology here. So I want to give Matt, our favorite Mets fan, a shout out uh, as well. So I think with that, Joe, we can we can thank our guests and um, remind them to visit us um, on the third Wednesday of December. Yes, thank you, everybody. We'll Thanks, see you again Sabrina, soon. Tony, Doug. And everybody. Bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that concludes this special edition of the Better Satellite World, the New York Space Business Roundtable, which took place on November 17th. We'll continue on this topic of ESG next month in December on the third Wednesday of the month with the New York Space Business Roundtable. And we will be talking about the unethical future of the space and satellite industry, taking a look at artificial intelligence. Again, I think you'll enjoy what you see and I hope you'll be there with us in December. Take care, everybody. <laughs>